Hi everyone, I'm Anthony Pastore. Welcome to UBS Trending. Thanks for being here. So OPEC recently announced it would be cutting production of oil by 2 million barrels per day. Putting the political machinations aside, we ponder the impact that this could have on the prices of oil and gas. Joining me now to discuss this is Jay Dobson from the UBS Chief Investment Office. Jay, good to see you. Great to see you, Anthony. Thanks for having me. So it's been a while since we had you in here, but uh, as you and I were talking just offline together, we talked about OPEC and the actions that took place recently, and we both agreed we got to get you here to talk mm. about it. So as I mentioned, OPEC cut 2 million barrels a day, which according to reports is the largest uh, cut in production since the start of the pandemic. So I'm right. looking at early 2020. What are your thoughts here? What happened and where did this decision come from? Yeah, so let's unpack it a little bit. So as you said, uh, OPEC in early October decided they were going to cut production by 2 million barrels. So it's really 1 million barrels, and you say, might say, well, how is 2 really 1? There's a number of members that can't produce their quota. So when you say you're going to cut by 2 million barrels, some produce, some countries are already producing at that lower level. So it really means a one million barrel per day cut. Mm. Uh, so in round terms, call it 1% of, of demand or, or supply be a little bit higher than that. Um, but the reality is, to put it in context, you know, prices are about where they were earlier this year. Prices where they are today, you know, call it $89 WTI, are about 7% higher than they were at the beginning of the year. And importantly, about 25% below where they were in June. So, you know, the prices, quite frankly, haven't reacted much, um, though they are higher. I think we really need to question why, to your question, did OPEC do this? And the real issue in my mind is demand. I mm. mean, demand year to date has been modestly weaker than we expected. And there's a number of pockets for that, but the real, real issue is China. China's demand recovery because of their COVID, their zero tolerance policy, policy um, has been slower to recover. You know, depending upon how you want to look at their demand, it's down in round terms a million barrels a day relative to where it would be in more normal times. So the reality is demand has been weaker. And I think OPEC was responding to that. There had been a lot of noise and cacophony in the marketplace uh, about, you know, what was happening to demand and could that impact price. So I don't want to say OPEC sort of did the reduction in production in order to fix price, but clearly they were seeing a large disconnect between what we call the physical market, where actually barrels are trading, and the financial markets, you know, sort of what we see on, on our screen. So I think in reality, they cut by about a million barrels. Um, this is really driven by their absence of spare capacity. Mm. Um, you only have about two, two and a half million barrels a day of, of spare capacity, all held in Saudi Arabia and UAE. Um, and let's see what happens with demand. Yeah. But um, it's an, it's, it was a surprising development. Right. And uh, uh, clearly we did hear from, uh, you know, Biden administration officials here in the States. They were very upset about that decision. But maybe you can, I hate to use this terminology, but dumb it down a little bit, right? Um, when you think about demand, as you explained China perfectly well, we all know that the shutdowns there have been fairly epic. Um, people aren't even allowed out of their homes. But prices had been really spiking here for a while before they started to decline at the gas pump. Is, does any of that demand or do, do we see a lower demand of gasoline in the U.S. and other European countries because of the price increases or is this really purely based off of the numbers that are coming out of China? No, I, I would say really it was uh, when you talk gasoline prices, because remember, gasoline prices are driven by oil prices, but as well by refining capacity. And we definitely saw as prices in the U.S., summertime, June, got over $5, we saw a demand response. It was a little difficult to see because the, no, the sort of data that we watch out of the Energy Information Administration was noisy. Mm -hmm. But I think in hindsight, we can say there was a demand reaction. And it's funny, in September, we're seeing quite the opposite. As prices have come down, we're actually seeing a little more resilient demand here. You know, the question is sort of going forward, what happens uh, for both gasoline and diesel? We're in these shoulder months. Right. But yeah, I, I would say on average, globally, sort of oil demands the bigger sort of story, and that's what drove OPEC's decision. But if we get to gasoline and, and talk about that, I, I would argue uh, a lot of that was, you know, sort of demand that was a little weaker than expected in, in Europe and the, mm -hmm. and the U.S. Well, 
there you go. So that's the next question. I think that, that most people are asking is, now that we know that they've cut two million or how you described it, really it's like a million, but potentially we could see gas prices go up again. So what does this impact of the cut in oil production have on gas and diesel prices? Yeah, well, gasoline and diesel prices, I think, will drift higher. I don't think these are spiking higher. Again, now keep back in to mind, the levels we saw earlier this year. Exactly. Okay. Keep in mind that we're in a shoulder period as kids have gone back to school. Demand seasonally, you know, softens uh, on, a, on a seasonal basis. Mm -hmm. So we've got that moving for us. You know, refineries, though they'll go into some maintenance, will be, you know, working very hard to rebuild inventories. The refining margin, or what we call the crack spread, the dollars, the margin that refiners make for generating or, or, or producing oil, diesel, and, and gasoline, you know, quite frankly, is pretty wide. So those mm -hmm. guys will run as hard as they can to rebuild inventories. You know, the real story here is diesel. Diesel hasn't come down as much as gasoline has. And diesel, quite frankly, whether you're talking about a farmer's tractor to a tractor trailer we see on the highways moving goods around the U.S., you know, that really is the workhorse fuel of the U.S. And it hasn't come down as mm -hmm. much. Uh, and hopefully building inventory inventories, uh, that's going to be an important input. But I, I don't expect the oil price uh, to rise a lot, uh, certainly in the very, very near term. Certainly as we go into 2023, we do anticipate, and hopefully we'll get to talk a little bit about things like the you know uh, EU's oil embargo and some of the other elements on the horizon that could right. have a bigger impact on oil prices than, quite frankly, the OPEC decision. But in the very near term, between now and, say, the election, I'd say, you know, sort of oil, gasoline, and diesel prices sort of drift higher. Yeah, and we pulled up, we had an oil chart up there, crude oil, WTI crude, and, and, and you know, it's, it's certainly gone up and down, but it's, it, you know, trend line worthy, it is pretty flat when you think about where we ended up versus a year ago. We're almost at the same levels that we started. So it's not like it's, it's really continually gone up. We did see it decline again a few months back. Yeah, we're pulling, well, there's the, that's, that's crude oil right on the screen there. But let me ask you this, Jake, because this is a, a pretty important question, especially given how we talk about it here at UBS, is the energy transition yeah. theme. Does this change anything here in this OPEC cut? And as you mentioned, there are other things coming next year that may be even more important to discuss. But as far as OPEC is concerned, does it change anything? Well, I think it changes from an energy transition perspective. I mean, I think what we all have to think about, Anthony, is, you know, demand over the next two decades. Think of population growth, urbanization. You're going to see a tremendous growth in demand. And quite frankly, a lot of this is happening in the developing world, not in the developed world. So I think energy demand goes up a lot. And I think, you know, the International Energy Agency has done a good job at framing it. We haven't been investing enough in fossil fuels. And we haven't been in investing enough in renewables. So, you know, to meet that demand, we need more supply. So sort of the obvious question is, you know, are, are we moving fast enough on the energy transition? N no, quite frankly, we're not. And we need to move faster. But I think what we're being shown uh, over the last, call it, eight or, or ten months in, in the U.S. and quite frankly globally is that the energy transition is going to be really complicated mm -hmm. and likely fraught with a ton of volatility. And if our, our sort of listeners are, are keen, they'll realize volatility, code word for higher prices. Mm -hmm. Well, then th that really brings up an interesting point. As far as the investing side of the story, is it a good time to be owning energy equities given, uh, you know, as a hedge to energy prices and what the future of that could look like? Yes. The single yeah. answer I'd say is yes. So from a policy perspective, we're overweight uh, U.S. energy equities. Um, but I'd say from, from a hedge perspective, you know, we all go to the gasoline pump and we pay higher prices and we slap our foreheads and complain about it. Um, the reality is we should own energy equities because since we're paying more there, you know, likely the companies are going to be making more money. Um, you know, these stocks, as you can see on the screen, have done reasonably well mm -hmm. year to date. They're the best performing sector in the S&P 500, but we think there's still a long way to go. Valuations are attractive. We have a constructive outlook on crude oil prices for next year. And perhaps most importantly that I don't think it's talked about enough is what we call capital discipline. These companies aren't taking the money and reinvesting tons of it back in their business. They're investing some, let's call it 20, 25 percent of that. But a lot of it is going to, you know, share repurchases and dividends and variable dividends. So giving money back 
back to shareholders. Um, and I think that's a new and pretty exciting development in the energy business. So makes it a far more sort of investor and shareholder friendly investment, you know, sort of going along with the hedge you get to the gasoline prices you pay at the pump. Yeah. And you see that in the in the medium, medium term at least? Yeah, certainly next 12 months, mm -hmm. I think so. Yeah, I, I think it makes a lot of sense. You know, you could make an argument for a period longer than that. As right. I said, demand is continuing to grow. You know, we really don't see a lot of new supply in fossil fuels coming on globally until middle of the decade. So you're probably set up for, you know, a two or three year period. I'm always, you know, sort of loath to look out that far. My crystal ball is never quite as accurate as I want it to be. But, you know, look, sitting here with a six to 12 month horizon, yeah, I feel very, very good about, about energy equities at current valuations. Jay, thank you. An ever evolving discussion, energy, yeah. as uh, you know, as being an energy analyst for your career. Um, but uh, I also want to get you back to have a further discussion on energy transition yeah. because it is a really complicated topic and it's not just about switching everything to climate friendly initiatives. There's ways that these all these companies have to work together where you have to use fossil fuels and you have to engage. And now you've talked about that with us in the past, but I think it begs uh, time begs to have that conversation again. So we'll get I you back. completely agree because yeah. fossil fuels are an important part of the transition. Right. They're not the end game, but um, you, you, you need to have a them apart absolutely. Yeah. Have a diversified equity portfolio, well, uh, you'll be disappointed. Perfect. Jay, thanks very much. Always good to see you. Thanks, Anthony. Good. Jay Dobson from the Chief Investment Office. And for more information, please visit our website at ubs.com forward slash views, and you can follow us on social media. UBS has content on all the platforms, including LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Plus, you can find all of our past UBS trending episodes on demand. And if you have any questions about your portfolio, make sure to speak with a financial advisor. Until next time, I'm Anthony Pastore. Have a great day, everybody. And remember to keep your eyes on what's trending. We'll see you soon.